Let's see here. I'm going to start admit, admitting people. And if you feel like moving your chair so you have a better view, those chairs are not meant to stick there, do whatever you want with them. Just one second. So we're going to be recording this as well and sending it out on Zoom to others. Peter, tell me when. We're live. We are so close. <laughs> and she's so thinking on my phone. It's a nice picture. Don't you think we got a good picture? Yeah. So it's a fun. That's a nice picture. Waiting for dinner. If, if I, had I had a camera, I'd take a picture of that Jinx. picture. Huh? Jinx is here. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jinx. Hi, Jinx. Yeah. Hi, Jinx. Hi, Jinx. Yeah. That's true. You hear that a lot. You hear that a lot, don't you? So, so Jinx, Jinx was a successful artist, artist here yeah. and, and, and sold and, sold and, and presented and we appreciate it. Right. Are we ready? Uh, yes, I believe we are. Let me just see if there's, there's other people in the waiting room. Should we sign in? Thanks everybody for your Zoom patience. Okay, cool. As people join, I'll let them know. Abbreviations. Let's start. The president uh, said uh, yesterday. So I go with two and three. Not the technology. Congratulations. He goes EP four. So I'm the family American. So the Rockford Valley Foundation. Short term. On my left is Steve Bartry. Trails. 
And we exhibited them. Everybody, Everybody said, said we well, didn't exhibit them long enough, enough. So, so we were able to bring some of them back, them back here, here, and we, and we will have them until December the 5th for, for the community to come in. And then, uh, so we Everybody says, Publication, which, which we have 10 of, of, and today you can pay $20 plus tax for it. And if you go on Amazon, you can also find those different products. So, so Stephen is going to not belabor all of the hours that we put in to pull this program off. Hundreds. And then all of the support that we got. And, and the wonderful, the wonderful dinner, dinner we had at Glenthorne for the artists. All, all the publicity, publicity where we participated with, with the, the Waynesboro, Waynesboro Arts Festival, Festival and the Rose Arts Festival. We were, we were all three, three on, the on the same weekend. weekend. And that, that weekend, weekend is referred to as both Columbus Day Weekend and Indigenous People Day Weekend. So that was when all three of those events occurred, and it was a great collaboration. Stephen, welcome again. He's been over here. Uh, fortunately, he's only made it for us. I've lived all around. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. We are looking forward to not learning everything in this book, not learning everything. And, and it will be it will be interesting to follow, to follow you with Anthony, with Anthony whose, whose passion at this, this stage of his life, life may, may or may not be any greater than your passion for over, over many years. Many years. We'll, we'll let you tell us about your, your background, background and about plenty of painting, 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 this book, anything, anything you want this audience, this audience to, understand. to understand. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, I've, I've always been interested, interested in art, in art uh, uh, from, from the time, time of I was a child. And I first studied art in school. Going out to walk. Going out to walk while I watch this Zoom. Hopefully, it'll still be there. Uh, along the way, I complained to a friend of mine that I would start a studio painting and not finish it. My life kind of interrupted the progress of painting. My friend, he said, well, Doherty, uh, I need to take you out and teach you about plein air painting because you can get something satisfying done in a couple of hours and work it into your life. Um, so I went out with Tom. Uh, and he showed me about plein air. He said, I'm going to see you here and you talk to me a bit about plein air. And the point really he was trying to make was that it serves a number of purposes. One of them being that you can make a good use of limited amounts of time if you're trying to fit it into your work schedule, your family schedule. If you get gather together your portable equipment. Some artists even throw it all into a backpack and you can go out and paint for a couple of hours. Um, I, I used to do a lot of traveling. I was editor of an art magazine and was judging shows and giving lectures and whatnot. And invariably the, you know, my meeting would be on Saturday, but I had to fly out on Friday. So I had extra time. And so following my friend Tom's advice, I started taking my painting supplies with me, and whenever I had time, I could use it if, uh, to work on small paintings. So that's what got me into it. And uh, I 
also it, it's a very social activity. So there are lots of groups of artists that work together out who are part of plein air societies and organizations. So plein air often uh, offered me an opportunity to spend time with other artists and share our mutual interest. Um, the term plein air is uh, comes from the French, which I mean just literally means in the open air. And uh, if you're an artist, you know, we love uh, terms that are either French or Italian, because it makes it se our painting activity seem far more uh, exciting than it is. Um, the the uh, crust of it is, the crux of it is the, that you work outdoors. And artists have always worked outdoors. It's, um, it's been part of their nature. But it was, it was at the end of the 19th century when people like Claude Monet and others started exhibiting their plein air paintings. Before that, artists thought of the paintings as sketches or studies and preliminary works for major studio paintings. But at the end of the 19th century, artists started showing them as completed works of art, uh, particularly Monet, but he had a whole colony of artists around him in Giverny. Um, and there were that movement came to the United States. So there were people doing plein air. There were there was a group out in uh, Brown County, Indiana. There was a group on Long Island. Uh, William Merritt Chase used to teach out on Long Island. So it it was a, um, a kind of an idea that caught on with a lot of artists, um, and uh, it continues today. And part of the I think what uh, is so attractive is um, you can have events such as the one that we worked on together here at Rockfish Valley, um, where uh, people from the community can come together and look at watch what you're doing, ask questions, learn about it, and it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to give your email address. You just show up while people are out painting and you can learn from it. And some of the research that's been done by organizations that sponsor plenary events is that a lot of people come just because they're really interested in educating themselves and considering the possibility of them painting. Uh, it's, it all seems very approachable and easy to get involved with. Um, so events are, take place all over the country. Some of them are sponsored by commercial galleries. Some of them are by nonprofit groups such as the Rockfish Valley Foundation. Some of them are organized by uh, municipalities. So a, a, a city might want to help kind of set up something that promotes their community as an artistic uh, location. Um, so there are all different reasons why it gets uh, organized. And um, the typical event is that the artists start painting for anywhere from say two to 10 days before the, the, the big exhibit. Um, they turn their paintings in, um, they're marked on the back to prove that they were all done at that time, they were not done in advance. Uh, the artists frame the pictures, put them on display someplace, and then people come to see them. And what they love about them is that these are paintings of the places they know and love. It's, it's the reflection of their community um, through the eyes of an artist. And that's very appealing to a lot of people. Um, so they're, they're very popular. And my, my last uh, job before I retired was editing a magazine called Plan Air. And it, it reported on the artists who were involved in Plan Air and also the events. So in, you know, there would be a column in there to talk about who the prize winners were at a, at a Plan Air event, such as the ones that Anthony re recently went to in West Texas. Um, it also profiles artists to, about how they work, what their equipment and supplies are. And then there are historic articles as well. And um, because, you know, every, anybody who's involved in plein air eventually starts to kind of think about the great artists of the past who, who really brought this to um, a, a fine art. And uh, I brought a, a few books of people who that, um, who are my favorites uh, from the past. 
um, most notably Frederick Edwin Church, who was a, a 19th century artist who um, traveled all over the world doing his plein air paintings. He went to Me Mexico a number of times, he went to Cuba, he went to South America, um, out on the west coast of the United States. Sometimes he would go by himself, sometimes he would go by, with groups of scientists, so there was a geologist and a uh, an environmentalist, and they were all working together. together. So Church, uh, he eventually built himself a spectacular home in Hudson, New York, called Olana. Um, and a lot of the paintings are the views from Olana. So this is one book, for example, I have of the paintings that Church did in Maine. And there's also a, a book about the, um, it says, fern hunting among these picturesque mountains and it's church's paintings in Jamaica because he spent time painting there. Um, his, uh, his oil sketches are a large collection of them are owned by the Cooper Hewitt Museum in, in New York City. And the reason they're there is because the, the sisters who started the museum thought that these were among the best teaching tools for our people interested in art. If you look at the work of Frederick Church, you could learn a lot about the, the process of painting, the art of painting. Um, so they bought this huge collection from him uh, and put it on display for people as, as a kind of teaching tool. Um, the other artist who's influenced me, whose work I've always admired, is uh, John Singer Sargent. He's a um, 19th century painter born in um, Florence, Italy, but uh, born to American parents. So he's considered an American painter. And he, um, he tra traveled all over, the, all, all over the world to the Canadian Rockies across the United States. His main income was from doing portraits, but uh, he loved doing uh, plein air paintings, either in oil or in watercolor. Um, and he was just, an incredibly skillful uh, artist, a uh, very talented guy who was a uh, pianist. He was, uh, spoke several languages. He was a pretty amazing guy. Um, so going back a little further than those guys, there's a, a French painter by the name of Corot, who uh, traveled to Italy in 1820s as on a, he won the uh, Prix de Rome, which at that time was the pinnacle of an artist's uh, career. And it gave him a chance to live in Rome for two years and paint. So he did a, a lot of plein air paintings in Rome and was in the company of artists who come from, who traveled from Germany and uh, through uh, you know, Northern, Italy, uh, Northern Europe. Um, so this is a book that I have called Corot in Italy. It's about the work that he did uh, in Italy. Um, the mentor I mentioned, the guy who influenced me, uh, one time organized a trip of artists to go and paint in the exact same spots where Corot worked in the, in the 1820s. Um, because there is a map of exactly where he painted and what he painted. So Tom thought it was a great idea to follow in the footsteps of Corot, which was a wonderful idea. So, and then I have a couple of books. These are, uh, over the years, uh, collectors who were, have put together, assembled co big collections of plein air paintings, in large part because there was a, you know, they're, they're less expensive than big studio paintings. Um, you know, uh, Cy Twombly, who's from Lexington, Virginia, had a, one of his paintings sold at auction for $77 million. Um, but there, there are a lot of plein air paintings are available for a whole lot less money. So um, over the years, people, uh, collectors have assembled big collections of plein air. This one, um, it's a book about uh, a whole collection of plein air paintings assembled by Eugene Victor Thaw, who um, was a big supporter of the um, Morgan Library in New York City. Uh, and there, there were others, there was a curator from the National Gallery in London who had a big collection. His name is Gear, I think, G-E-R-E. -E. So um, 
I've, I've bought books with these because they're, they're wonderful you know, kind of samples of all the work that was done by artists, some well-known, some not so well-known, uh, mostly European, but some Americans as well. So um, that's sort of what I got, got me involved. What I love about plein air painting, and I think one of the things that appeals to a lot of artists is it's an excuse to get outdoors and paint. It's a focused activity. You're not, you, you can't be distracted if you're outside by yourself, you, you, you turn your cell phone off, you just set up and paint and um, you kind of get into that creative zone of working directly for na from nature. So it has a great appeal just because of the kind of activity that's involved. And the other is that if you, if you get a plein air painting that's really successful, you could use it as the basis of a larger studio painting. So then you can, uh, you can you've got this as a, a, it reminds you not only of what you saw, but how you felt about being on location. And you can put all of that into a big studio painting. Um, so it has it has all of those appeals for the artist, plus the social aspect of it, um, the visibility of participating in an event and, and selling your work um, and, um, traveling to places that you may not know. Um, I've done quite a few plein air events in Virginia, and those have given me a wonderful opportunity to get to know more about my state uh, than I otherwise would, because I spend a week living in a, in a community, whether it's Abingdon or Norfolk, um, I meet people who are connected with the community um, and enjoy the whole experience of being in their, in their town. So that's my long-winded way of telling you who I am. <laughs> and we'll take a short-winded way of having Stephen uh, tell us a little bit about some of the things you have Thank on you. display. Are we looking at paintings that uh, you had planned to paint? Were they all surprises? Uh, how did you decide on locations? here at the Rockfish Valley. Uh, I'm happy to say a number of them have, have sold. Mm -hmm. And we asked Stephen today to bring some uh, just to talk about. There's one of the bridge right outside this building. Mm -hmm. And how did you decide to do that? And how long did it take to do that? Well. The main decision for me is what's happening with the light. Uh, because as everybody, every artist knows, painting is really about light, light and shadow. Um, you know, a subject can be boring in a dull light or, you know, amazing in a, in a different light. So when I go out to paint, I kind of assess where the light is. I always pr I prefer to paint looking into the light because it silhouette shapes and um, creates more of a contrast between light and shadow. So um, and I also sometimes I like to have landmarks that kind of explain where I am. Some a lot, other times I don't. But in the, this case with the bridge, I was walking around looking at the property, looking for a kind of landmark that said this is where I am. And the bridge seemed to say that to me. Plus, uh, the light was kind of filtering from the background, from the distance in, towards the foreground. Uh, there was a highlight along the edge of the railing of the bridge. Um, I could incorporate the water as well as the distant mountain. So it had a lot of interesting elements that I could put into a painting. Um, and the same is true with most of the, you know, the one that you can see on the easel is of um, the James River down by Buena Vista. Um, and it was the same kind of thing. I was looking, I, I was very interested in the fall colors. That was really what motivated me to go out and paint. But I set up in such, looking into the light and um, looking for, you know, a, particularly the way the light hit the distance uh, behind the, the mountain. So, um, you know, then I worked up, I, I, the way I work is I block in, I, I cover the whole canvas with uh, a yellow ochre, 
and then I wipe out the negative shape so that I can take a look, kind of assess what I think is going to, how the painting is going to develop and whether I think it's going to be effective or not. I like to get a kind of preview of what's going to happen before I spend three hours or so painting. And I normally spend somewhere between two and three hours uh, on a painting, depending on the size of the canvas and, um, and, the, and the weather conditions and you know, things like that. So um, some artists will do, put in more time with that. It's not uncommon for artists to go back to the same location uh, at the same time on a different day and develop the paintings further. Um, I tend to just do it all at, at once. Um, because conditions change so differently from day to day, from hour, from one hour to another. So um, anyway, so I did those, and I previously did a in the early spring. I did another painting over from the Camille Trail, um, and it was a similar kind of arrangement. I, I lately I've been I really like long horizontal formats for my painting. So typical canvas now, like the one up there, is ten inches by twenty inches. And I like that format uh, and the kind of space that it incorporates. Um, so I did the same thing when I set up in the spring. I kind of covered the canvas with yellow ochre, wiped out the shapes, and then started articulating what was what I saw in the landscape. Um, I, and I finished it in about three hours, maybe. And um, I might have done a little bit of touch up later because. You know, it was funny. Somebody asked me, the, I finished painting someplace and the person said to me, was it successful? And I, my usual response is, I have no idea because until I get it home, I, have no, I can't even evaluate what's working, what's not working. You know, typically when I take it home, especially because uh, looking into the light changes your, um, the way your eyes perceive values and colors. So when I get it in the home and, and I control the light, uh, sometimes things stand out that really are horrible. They're just, you know, not going to work. So I have to change them. Other times I'm kind of su pleasantly surprised that the painting is better than I expected. So um, it, you know, that's why my response to the question was, uh, I don't know until I get it home. So. But what Steve did know on that particular painting was that he was trying to identify a place and we had a committee meeting and each of the artists brought a painting they had done and on the area that we were getting ready to set for the event. And his, he had done something to his computer and he had it set as the background of the whole computer. I'm sure all of you all know how to do that. Well, I looked at it and I said, well, you know how to sell a painting <laughs> had the corner had the corner palm has in it, so as you can imagine, it's now hanging in our kitchen. Uh, so yes, picking a place that has recognition. And can you explain the light where it hangs? Oh, it's plein air hard. must. And, and maybe Anthony can talk to this, but where these paintings get hung, they pick up light, and we were able to take Steve's painting and put it in a corner that gets both a morning light and an afternoon light. Mm -hmm. And we also have a like a hanging light. And it's amazing how that thing comes to life. And so we're now basically eating in the dark except for looking at his painting. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that oh, effort. And, and I know the bridge is here. Uh, it, it's just wonderful to see how our little valley comes to life with the, the work of the artists, which you can see around me. Uh, and Steve's got a couple others of his here, which we can show uh, on my right. Uh, we, we set up for, for Anthony over his right shoulder, uh, some of his work, and then over his, uh, in between his shoulders and mine. Uh, gosh, it's this fantastic thing, which I hadn't seen before. Uh, with a little paint still on the easel, uh, when you talk about coming to life. Uh, so he's going to tell us now, uh, since he has not yet written his book on <laughs> plein air painting. Not yet. Not yet. We, we expect it of you. Uh, but please, uh, I think it would be interesting for you not only to give your bio and background, but just tell us what you've done in the last um, 36 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I'm Anthony. Um, I'm going to get right off the jump with I'm not a public speaker. I'm 22 years old. And, uh, up until now, the only audience I've really spoken to was 63 second graders. And they were, they were very gracious in their in the attention they gave me. So I appreciate you guys for coming. Um, I'm a Richmond artist, so I love to track up to the Blue Ridge Mountains to paint. It's one of my favorite subjects. And uh, I really got introduced to plein air through some very gracious mentors who generously gave me their time and uh, fielded all my questions because I, I tend to have a lot of them. Um, just like Steve here took me out for coffee one day and I just, I had to cut it off because I, I just could keep asking him questions. <laughs> so thank you for that. But uh, the last, I do a lot of plein air work. Steve already kind of explained what it is and what it means to artists. So uh, I really enjoy it. I love getting outdoors. It is a great excuse to get outside, which is something that I really hold near and dear to my heart. And over the last 48 hours, I've been up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I had just gotten back from Texas recently. Um, Steve mentioned that I just did an event there. That was my first time in Texas and a beautiful place. Um, a lot of artists far greater than me. And uh, it was a pleasure to show with them and paint a new landscape. But um, the last 48 hours, I got back and I've been painting back in the Blue Ridge. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. This one I was done yesterday um, towards the James River Visitor Center. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that area. But uh, I think this is Fuller's Rock, that mountain in the distance. And then uh, this is the James River as it carves its path through the Blue Ridge Mountains and makes its way, makes its, makes its way through Lynchburg and then to Richmond. But uh, that was one of yesterday's paintings. And this one was from today up on the parkway again. Um, this was a series of waterfalls that ran down and under a old logging railroad that I found this morning. I'd never been to this spot and uh, it was really a jewel and I was excited to find it. And um, it was a lot of fun, but I do this a lot. Um, not to say that I'm any good at it, but it is something that I really enjoy. And I started doing plein air pretty serious back in 2017. So have you done 100 paintings? Probably more than 100. <laughs> 100? 200. Yeah, Three. Probably, yeah. So yeah. How many do you think? Uh, 500? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> What's the smallest? Um, the smallest I've done in plein air that I can think of is probably three by six inches. And in and, and that three by six, how big is the landscape? Um, I mean, any landscape reads a lot bigger than a three by six. So I have to do quite a bit of condensing. Right. So we, this is a very serendipity uh, focused event. We asked the newspaper if they would come and do things. We asked the various media folks to do things and so many of them did. But one thing that I don't think we were quite ready for was a young woman uh, from the Waynesboro newspaper arrived and it was on a Friday. We had just sort of uh, started, it was a Saturday. It was, and she arrived at the Camille Trailhead and Anthony was painting down the way. Steve was uh, gathering up his easel from having painted. And she went around and talked to maybe 10 of the artists that she found, she must have been here for several <clears throat> hours. She wrote a story and people called us from Richmond saying it is on the front page of the leisure section of the Richmond Times Dispatch for the Sunday. And it then got picked up by three other newspapers. And, and they spoke about Anthony, they spoke about Steve, but this woman did a magnificent job of enjoying herself and wrote this, you still find the, the link to the article, uh, but the word got around and the people discovered the Anthony's of our group, Steve's, others who are here, and we never anticipated the great success. But this guy, uh, if you go on his website, you're gonna learn a bit more about it. And so I'm going to embarrass him and say, what are your motivations? And what is your website address? My website is anthonybose.net. Feel free to go on there and buy everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's learning marketing pretty quick. <laughs> so as far as motivations go, like I said, I love to get outside. Planner is definitely an excuse to do so. And uh, I feel very blessed to do what I do for a living. 
and that definitely pushes me to continue trying to grow and trying to capitalize on opportunities like this that might make me uncomfortable in the moment but I look back on them and I'm really glad that I do them or like going to Texas it seemed really scary at first but now that it's over I can look back at it and think fondly on everybody I got to meet and the experiences had so um, as far as motivations go gratitude is definitely one probably the biggest one and um, I really enjoy learning and trying to improve and um, the endless pursuit of that is something another one that really motivates me to keep going. Steve. Oh, yes, question. Thank you. Two questions. First of all, how many things did you sell on Sunday? For this event? Yeah. I believe it was three. In several cents. Oh, good. That's great. And also, I, I wondered if you would share your beginning process when Steve said he covered it with the yellow ochre mm -hmm. and then and then picked lights out. Mm -hmm. I, that, I found that that very interesting and, and sometimes for me the hardest thing is getting going yeah and so i wondered what is your process to start beginning so i don't have a great one size fits all answer for you it changes every time but usually i'm trying to find simple shapes and block in masses so steve will cover the whole thing and then kind of erase the more prominent areas and would you say it's more of a silhouette that you scratch out at first yeah mm -hmm. so i'm going for large shapes just like that and um so that's usually how I'm starting. For example, with this one, I was hiking up to the falls and wanted to find one that I really liked. And uh, this is the one that got my attention. And I wanted to kind of condense it down to a, a simple design as I could. So I, I saw the main lines kind of cutting through here and then a bunch of strong diagonals all out from kind of my center of interest falls right there. So I kind of, I, I washed out originally with this, this earth tone because I wanted it to read against that, these light colors that I was laying in. And then I kind of drew in my design, all the strong diagonals, because I wanted to keep that throughout the whole entire painting. It's like laying the foundation in the beginning. Then I went for the light colors and then the dark colors, kind of breaking it into two values, keeping it really simple. And then from there, I just kind of built up the darks and uh, tried to get variety of color and stuff like that. Very good. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. And uh, if you want a real beginner tip, I first took some pictures on Instagram and then took like the drawing tool and literally carved out the shapes that I wanted to connect all the lights and darks. And uh, I could probably show you on my phone better. Than <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the technologies are supporting plein air in a different way. Yeah. I should say exception. Uh, a lot of the events that we participate in have very strict rules. And one of them is you can't use uh, the camera or the, or the smartphone at all when you're do, working on the painting. Um, a lot of artists do it as Anthony does, and it's a great tool, but in these competitive events, they tend to forbid it. Um, they want you to do everything, you know, wet paint uh, from, the, from nature, you know, um, the, and they have other rules, you know, because just to control things. But um, you know, it's like anything else. If you're if you're participating in a sporting event, you have to be very conscious of the rules. If you're just going out to you know play baseball or hike or whatever, you do whatever feels comfortable to you. So it's the same with plein air events. Uh, they give you know typically they'll send you a, like a two page form with all their rules and regulations and the, you know when you turn your paintings in and how they have to be framed and on and on and on um, and i'm sure that was the case in the, at the event in texas where anthony painted um, so you know it's but on your own you do what you want you paint on any surface you want you paint with you can uh, use a cell phone you can use a an ipad you can use whatever you know the, uh, art is, is art is not about um, the how really it's it's about the end result the, you know, the what you, you realize so um, you know uh, anyway let's well show us what you yeah what you did yeah so I certainly don't advise using your phone like Steve said <laughs> if the rules say not to <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did not do this in plain air text it's just a disclaimer but uh, <laughs> this is kind of me blocking in. 
a solid line, the shape I wanted to have through the falls there. Yeah. I don't know if how well you can see it on here, but uh, I just took the white and then kind of carved out the shape. And then I drew in some dark directional lines that I wanted to keep for my design. And uh, that's kind of the foundation of what I was working with today. And how long did that take? Well, this one took about two hours up there. And it was pretty cold. <laughs> Invitational. Um, jury. Yeah. So yeah. I'd be selected. Jury. Interesting. And how many artists? I think there was about 32 or something like that. 36. 36. <laughs> she knows. Well, the cool thing is that we did not have a rule sheet here. We actually have had, I think, six artists after our plein air contact us because of the publicity and the word being spread saying, please put us on the list for next year. Mm -hmm. And those artists uh, will be vetted by the committee, but already the committee has said, wow, mm -hmm. you know. I'm waiting to get a newspaper uh, next door, maybe I heard the question, oh. but it was a whole front section of the Richmond Times that living. I mean, you just, and most of the next page, we were one, we were one away. We have some so, more questions. Okay. Questions I can't see. Sorry. Hey. Um, Anthony, I saw on your on social media the other day that you were painting with another artist, and they were using um, objects that they found in nature to assist them in their painting. I think it was um, the ice that they found yeah. in the mountains, like yeah. using that in their artwork. Do a lot of plein air artists use like physically the nature around them to help in their art? Some of them. Today I was kind of getting, I was looking for some strange textures in this one. So like I said, I washed it out with the earth tone first and then I took a random stick that I found and kind of scratched around. Not much of it's showing, but uh, just sometimes it works out to where it might get revealed and it, some of the texture still shows through. So it works out like that. But an artist, like she, she mentioned an icicle that was yesterday with my buddy Joey, but uh, I guess it is more frequent than I usually realized, but one of the artists in Texas took a cactus and was scraping away <laughs> for some of the grasses and that looked really good. So it really just comes down like, like they were saying that the end result is really all that counts. Well, yes, I, have, yeah, I have just you know, more out of curiosity versus process. And I'm sure your answer, Anthony, and yours as well are, could be different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a musician, one of the benefits that we have creating art is we get to listen to it over and over once we share. Mm -hmm. Yet, I've always been curious about the inner feelings of artists who are painters who actually orphan their paintings. They, they give them away and they never see them again. And so I guess my question is, how do you feel about that starting out of your career? giving away 300 paintings, 400 paintings that you may never see again. Yeah, I mean. And, and then I'd love to hear how that, you know, translates into uh, having uh, okay, a few more years under the belt giving mm -hmm. paintings away. Well, uh, to start off, those first 200, 300 are not going to be very good. So you just kind of get ah. over it. <laughs> yeah. But it's after a great that, thing to say to the people buying your pictures. <laughs> that the that doesn't fit market. <laughs> I passed the 200, 300. But uh, now um, I'm sad to see some of them go, but very happy to know that new collectors will really enjoy them, get to experience them each and every day. And uh, they're usually buying them because they really mean something to them. And uh, that that's more important to me than myself because I, I do a lot of painting. Are you photographing them? Do you keep a, a record? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, um, I've been at it a long time and I've got uh, stacks and stacks of plein air paintings I've done over the years, uh, either mostly ones like as Anthony said, where I was learning something and it, they were useful, but I don't really feel like I want to exhibit them or sell them. Um, 
you know, when you put together an exhibit, you usually try to get your best work and present it well. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, uh, occasionally there, I do a painting and my wife tells me I'm not selling it, um, especially paintings of our garden. You know, if, if I paint our garden, she owns it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are other people who, you know, if I paint, if I do paintings for friends, you know, like anniversary gifts or like uh, a next door neighbor, um, who has a spectacular uh, iris garden and I did a painting for her. So, um, but you know, uh, it's part of the process. As Anthony says, you know, as much as you might regret having sold the painting, it's very satisfying to know, <clears throat> you know, as Betsy was saying, that it becomes part of her household and um, something that she and her family can enjoy. Um, that's very satisfying to an artist. Um, uh, you know, some people are much more commercial about it. Um, years ago, I wrote an, a part of a book on uh, a guy named Thomas Kincaid, who was probably the biggest hustler that uh, ever came down the pike. Um, and, uh, you know, it was not about the, the joy of painting for him. It was about the business of art. And, um, and maybe that's how he had to approach it, or that was his personality. But for me, it's it, it's not that. I mean, if I if I just had to make a living at it, I would do something entirely different. Art, it, being an artist is not easy. It can be a joyous experience, but it's not. Um, you know, you could, I always I used to say I could probably make more money with my typing and editing skills than I could painting. Um, because I, you know, I was worked as an editor for you know, almost forty years, um, and uh, that's what paid my bills. Uh, so, you know, it's it's like anything else you do, whether you're a musician or an actor or a painter, you try to strike some balance between your passion and your need to make a living. Um, and you know, so that's what we all, you know, it's part of the process we all go through as creative people. So Anthony, that segues into, uh, are you a full-time artist? I am. And I knew that <laughs> because I wanted to ask you the next question. Do you consider in five years that that will be your goal in life? It is. It is today. It is. It is today. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Steve, you've had some very interesting careers. You've written books, you've been editing, but you've always focused definitely on your passion, yeah. your art. No job have you ever had that stepped an inch away from that passion. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, I think the first, I got a job as editor of a magazine called American Artist when I was 30 years old. And um, it was the best job I could have ever hoped for um, because it allowed me to work directly with artists, to do profile articles, instructional articles, inspirational articles, all about a subject that I loved and was passionate about. And that led me to other jobs that were similar. Over the years, I edited magazines on watercolor and drawing and plein air. Um, but always, you know, what excited me was the opportunity to work with artists. You know, I, I, I could pick any artist I wanted, call them up and interview them for an artist, for an article, and in the process, pick their brain about, you know, how, how do you work? What supplies do you use? And it was ostensibly for to share with the readers of the magazine, but at the same time, it, it educated me uh, about how artists work. So uh, I was very fortunate that, and unfortunately these days, um, it's probably a job I couldn't get anymore uh, because publications in general and, and uh, art magazines in particular um, are just not very good businesses and um, it's hard to make a living doing them. Um, interestingly, with this article that Peter mentioned, in some ways the downturn in the, in the newspaper industry has been a benefit to artists because they're also they're all desperate for content. They don't have writers, they can't pay writers, they can't pay editors to produce it. 
So when somebody comes along and does an article, uh, it gets picked up by all the other newspapers in that uh, in that business. You know, they're all publications are all owned by some large corporation, and, and they so they they have access to each other's content. And this has happened to me a number of times. I did an art. There was an article on my work years ago in Richmond Times this Herald, I think it is, and that was picked up by my local news uh, newspaper and others. Um, the funny thing was I, I was out painting on the beach in, in Mississippi in the Gulf Coast one time and a photographer came up behind me and asked if he could take my photograph. So he did and there is the silhouette of me and my painting supplies against the sunset. That was picked up by like 30 newspapers. Wow. Just, <laughs> they just loved the image, you know, it had nothing to do with me uh, or even plein air painting, but it, they picked it up. and. Um, it's sort of the good news, bad news about uh, the state of publishing today that um, every, everybody needs content. They're not necessarily willing to pay for it anymore. So uh, we, we've lucked out in that we gave them you know, con content they liked um, and they could keep it within their system of, of newspapers. So. Questions? I know you could tell them about the book and promote it, but, but before you do that, I have to tell you, my own experience with, uh, with the book, uh, after the chain out on my dot com, I was so blown away. Your, whoever's question was about how you uh, blocked out, how you were gonna start, it's all in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, how we did it, how we formats it, it's all in the book. But I was so excited because I'm not a painter and I'm an artistic major. And he goes through all of these art history uh, artists that who are so well known that were playing their painting and comes on through to the Boston School, the, the um, Hudson River School and all of that. So it made me more aware of what I had learned about them in how they were working. thing is penguin books is the one that has it now and so we qualified to buy 10 of them we still had to pay 15 dollars a piece for them mm -hmm. and we'll sell them for 20 to you all Please. yes sir so i just have like one other question you know uh more of a contemporary art history question mm -hmm. so we're in the you know hopefully the end of our pandemic you know and it's going to be is there a particular color that's been harder to find than other colors? We hear about supply chain issues. Mm. Everybody's, you know, uh, painting. People are, you know, painting or going to the movies. I would think it's the mad rush on painting supplies. I'm just curious if from the beginning of the pandemic uh, in March of say 2020 was a kind of a place to start. Mm. What are you? What did you see with the rise of new painters who are trying to? capture the outside world from being stuck inside? Well, I don't, I didn't run into any, I have not run into any supply issues in terms of buying paints and canvas. And um, the, the biggest impact was that a lot of the planner events we were all planning on got canceled. Um, you know, it, for people who make their living doing these events, 2020 was a dismal year because, you know, I know artists who get on the road and they'll go to 10 or 15 different events, you know, starting, you know, in, in, at the big, in early spring and going all the way through the fall. Um, and they make their living selling at those, uh, you know, exhibiting and selling their work. Well, 2020, it, it was nothing. 
Now it's it's only come back, like I think everything else, I mean, if you go to a concert or whatever, it's probably half the audience that used to go. Um, and with the plein air events, it's similar. There's a, there's a, the people who will come, but it's not nearly as many people as used to come. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to combine outdoor, instead where they used to put up, like I participated in an event in Norfolk where they used to use an indoor club that was really beautiful. Well, they didn't, they couldn't, they didn't think they could continue using that because of the pandemic. So they held it outdoors. And it's not, it's not the same kind of experience of seeing artwork um, on an easel outside under a tent as it would be on the wall of a, as a wall that kind of makes you feel, see it, the painting as it would be in your own home. Um, a lot of the events have tried, like everybody else, to, to do something virtual as a substitute uh, or fill in for the live events. And some of them have gotten very good at it. And some, um, there's an event that's held in, in Atlanta area called uh, the Olmstead Plein Air event. And they do a really good job of putting paintings online and promoting them online and promoting the artists online. Um, and they would ha they also get some of the artists to do demos so that there's an instructional aspect to it. Um, and so some events have sort of transitioned in that way to do virtual and uh, they may continue the virtual along with a live event as we're doing today. Um, so I think the biggest impact is as you know, with any, you know, whether it's you're talking about a symphony orchestra or a rock concert, um, 2020 was a pretty tough time for uh, people who make their living performing or exhibiting in front of a, uh, an audience. Um, hopefully, it, I think it's coming back gradually, but people are still kind of hesitant to uh, uh, go too far with you know indoor events or. Um, so it's going to take us a while to get back to where we were, I think, but uh, it's getting better. And I think the nice thing is, uh, you know, like I, we had some friends over for dinner. It was like they hadn't, people who had never been together before, they were so excited. Um, there's a lot of anticipation of the fact that you can get back to doing some of the events. So I think when there are events, you know, people will come with a lot of enthusiasm about it uh, because it's, it makes them feel as though, you know, they're getting back to something they love. That's uh, advice, good advice for us as well as anybody who's lucky enough to catch this uh, video, which I say we hope to make YouTube. But Anthony, I've put you on the spot here with a question. Uh, I've got a, a four, and a half year old granddaughter. And in her backyard in Richmond, uh, she has a big fence. And on that big fence, she has hung great big sheets of paper. And her last painting is maybe four feet by five feet. Uh, <laughs> and, and my wife identified it immediately as a uh, peacock. Peacock. <laughs> and, and what advice do you have to uh, to the parents of or grandparents of or what what help or uh, support did you get at an earlier time than when you were seventeen? I was going to say I'm not a parent yet, so I'm not too sure what it, <laughs> what I do for my kids. But uh, I had great support growing up. I always had the freedom to try new things um, with the expectation that I see them through at least till the end of the season or uh, until uh, some kind of seasonal change came along. So just making sure I finished what I started. But um, there was never a bunch of pressure to do things that I didn't want to do. So I would try and pass it along to my kids. If they like the trombone, I'd be getting them a trombone. If they like the paint, you come the paint and brushes. So I mean, I'd just be supportive just like my parents were. And I know you have one collector who is related to you. Yeah. <laughs> and so grandparents can have play a role. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I, I think you would agree that that's been a, a mentor relationship 
in your life. Absolutely. So all of us grandparents need to figure out how to, to follow that kind of advice and your advice. So if our audience, if we do this again, is fall our time? Spring, summer, what is our, where do we go from here? Season. It would sure be great. Let's do four and capture the season. <laughs> from the same spot. Uh, I went to the place from where I lost you, where the artist had been there, I guess, for a good number of years, and had been doing it for now. This was several years ago. Took a link from the internet because they had their own exhibits that was out for his outdoors. Um, you know, we were blessed with wonderful weather, <laughs> but um, we were able to go and see what they were working on um, during that time. But then there was also the paint job where <clears> you <throat> could go and watch them painting, and then um, they had they set up outdoors a small so, um, as they did everything but full, um, but people were getting so much love because they really loved and they had watched that they were painting. It was a very pleasant And that's Carmel, yeah. California. Yeah. And my wife and I have uh, witnessed a quick draw in Jackson, Old Wyoming. And they even do sculptures within that three hours or whatever yeah. they're given. Yeah. And and then and there's a running clock all the time. Yes. And then yeah. to go yeah. into the tent and watch something that was a blank canvas mm -hmm. sell for forty five thousand dollars, <laughs> it really kind yeah. of blows you away. Yeah, really yeah. Well I don't know if we'll get to that, but we sure want to get to a quick draw where we where we've got the artist saying, yay team, let's do a quick draw and Mm -hmm. I don't know. Would you do that? I'll do it. You'll do it. Sure. All right. So we got a hundred percent support so far. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unless there's anything further from the audience, I, I think we bring it to a close. Does do either you guys have any parting words you'd like to throw at us? You've got your paintings around you, and uh, Anthony, you got a few left. I keep looking at this one. Wow, that's really cool. Nice job. I would say. If you haven't started plein air painting and you might be anxious to start, I would just jump into it. Like this one, I knew if I sat around in my car thinking about how the painting could suck, if I did it for any longer than I already did, I might not have gone out today. So um, just jumping into it and getting something on the canvas early on is important for me. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Nicely done. That was fun. Yeah. That was fun. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank I'm you. the technology guy. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.